take a look at information technology risks. Information technologies can be misused to invade users' privacy and commit computer crimes. The costs include stolen identities, intellectual property and trade secrets, as well as the damage done to companies and individuals' reputations. Spyware is a software that secretly gathers information about users while they browse the web. This information could be used for malicious purposes. Adware is a form of spyware that collects information about the user to determine which advertisements to display in the user's web browser. Pinching is a sending fraudulent emails that seem to come from legitimate sources, such as a bank or a university. Farming is similar to pinching in that the internet users are directed to fraudulent websites within the interaction of stealing their personal information, such as social security numbers, passwords, bank account numbers, and credit card numbers. Baiting is similar to pinching attacks. What distinguishes it from pinching is the promise that the baiter gives to the recipient. Similar to baiting, quid pro quo involves a hacker requesting the exchange of critical data or login information for some service or prize. Keystroke loggers monitor and record keystrokes and can be software or hardware devices. Sometimes companies use these devices to track employees' use of email, the internet, and this use is legal. Sniffing is the capturing and recording of network traffic. Although it can be done for a legitimate reason, such as monitoring network performance, hackers often use it to intercept information. Spoofing is an attempt to gain access to a network by posing as an authorized user in order to find sensitive information, such as passwords and credit card information. Computer fraud is the unauthorized use of computer data for personal gain, such as transferring money from another's account or charging purchases to someone else's account. Many of the technologies discussed previously can be used for committing computer crimes. Another computer crime is sabotage, which involves destroying or disrupting computer services. Computer criminals change, delete, hide, or use computer files for personal gain. And computer criminals have been using ransomware to receive money from both individuals and corporations. A comprehensive security system protects an organization's resources, including information, computer, and network equipment. The information an organization needs to protect can take on many forms, emails, invoices transferred via electronic data interchanges or EDIs, new product designs, marketing campaigns, and or financial statements. Security threats involve more than stealing data. They include actions such as sharing passwords with coworkers, leaving a computer unattended while logged onto the network, or even spilling coffee on a keyboard. A comprehensive security system includes hardware, software, procedures, and personnel that collectively protect information resources and keep intruders and hackers at bay. There are three important aspects of computer and network security, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, collectively referred to as the CIA triangle. Confidentiality means that a system must not allow the disclosing of information by anyone who is not authorized to access it. Integrity refers to the accuracy of information resources within the organization. Availability means that computers and networks are operating and authorized users can access the information they need. A comprehensive security system must provide three levels of security. Level 1 for front-end servers, Level 2 for back-end systems, and Level 3 for the corporate network being protected against intrusion, denial of service attacks, and unauthorized access. When planning a comprehensive security system, the first step is designing fault-tolerance systems, which use a combination of hardware and software for improving reliability, a way of ensuring availability in case of system failure. A backup power unit continues to provide electrical power in the event of blackouts and other power interruptions and is most often used to protect servers. 
a redundant array of independent disks is known as a RAD system. It's a collection of disk drives used to store data in multiple places. RAD systems also store a value called checksum used to verify that data has been stored or transmitted without error. Mirror disks is a method used when two disks containing the same data are used. If one fails, the other is available, allowing operations to continue. Mirror disks are generally a less expensive solution. Threats can be categorized by whether or not they're intentional or unintentional. Intentional threats include hacker attacks and attacks by disgruntled employees, such as spreading a virus on the company network. Viruses are the most well-known computer and network threats. They are a type of malware, short for malicious software, which is any program or file that is harmful to computers or networks. A virus consists of a self propagating program code that is triggered by a specific time or event. When the program or operating system containing the virus is used, the virus attaches itself to other files and the cycle continues. A worm travels from computer to computer in a network, but it does not usually erase data. A Trojan program contains code intended to disrupt a computer, network, or website, and it's usually hidden inside a popular program. A logic bomb is a type of Trojan program used to release a virus, worm, or destructive code. A backdoor, also called a trapdoor, is a programming routine built into a system by its designer or programmer. A blended threat is a security threat that combines the characteristics of computer viruses, worms, and other malicious codes with vulnerabilities found on public and private networks. A denial of service or DOS attack floods a network or server with service requests to prevent legitimate users access to the system. In the context of security, social engineering means using people skills, such as being a good listener or assuming a friendly, unthreatening air, to trick others into revealing private information. In addition to these intentional threats, loss or theft of equipment and computer media is a serious problem, particularly when a computer or flash drive contains confidential data. Biometric security measures use physiological elements that are unique to a person and cannot be stolen, lost, copied, or passed on to others. The following list describes some biometric devices and measures. Facial recognition identifies users by analyzing the unique shape, pattern, and positioning of facial features. Fingerprints scans a user's fingerprint to verify them against prints stored in a database. Hand geometry compares the length of each finger, the teleslucence of fingertips, and the webbing between fingers against stored data to verify users' identities. Iris analysis uses a video camera to capture an image of the user's iris and then uses software to compare the data against stored templates. Palm Prints uses the palm's unique characteristics to identify users. Retinal Scanning scans the retina using a binocular eye camera, then checks the data against stored database information. Signature Analysis checks the user's signature as well as deviations in pen, posture, speed, and length of time used to sign the name. Vein analysis analyzes the pattern of veins in the wrist and the back of the hand without making any direct contact with the veins. Voice recognition translates words into digital patterns, which are recorded and examined for tone and pitch. Some drawbacks of biometrics are how the high cost, user's reluctance, and the complex installation process. The three main non-biometric security measures are callback firewalls and intrusion detection systems. A callback modem verifies whether a user's access is valid by logging the user off after he or she attempts to connect to the network and then calling the user back at a predetermined number. 
a firewall is a combination of hardware and software that acts as a filter or barrier between a private network and an external computer or networks, including the Internet. A firewall can examine data passing into or out of a private network and decide whether to allow the transmission based on user's ID, the transmission's origin and destination, and the transmission content. The main types of firewalls are packet filtering firewalls, application filtering firewalls, and proxy servers. In addition, these firewalls record all incoming and outgoing connections and packets that are rejected might be a warning sign of an unauthorized attempt. Application filtering firewalls are generally more secure and flexible than packet filtering firewalls, but they're also more expensive. A proxy server is a software that acts as an intermediary between two systems, between network users and the internet, for example. Although firewalls can do a lot to protect networks and computers, they don't offer complete security. Sophisticated hackers and computer criminals can circumvent almost any security measure. Here are some guidelines for improving a firewall's capabilities. Identify what data must be secured and conduct a risk analysis. Compare a firewall's features with the organization's security needs. Compare the features of packet filtering firewalls, application filtering firewalls, and proxy servers to determine which type of these addresses your network's security needs. Examine the cost of firewalls and remember the most expensive is not necessarily the best. Another alternative is to build a firewall instead of purchasing one, so do it in-house. Firewalls protect against external access, but they leave networks unprotected from internal intrusions. Access controls are designed to protect systems from unauthorized access in order to preserve data integrity. Terminal Resource Security is a software feature that erases the screen and signs the user off automatically after a specified length of inactivity. A password is a combination of numbers, characters, and symbols that's entered to allow access to a system. To increase the effectiveness of passwords, change them frequently and follow some guidelines. Passwords should be eight characters or preferably longer. Passwords should contain a combination of upper and lowercase letters, numbers, and special symbols. And passwords should never be written down. Because of the obvious limitations and shortcomings of passwords, researchers are hard at work to replace passwords with other authentication methods that are less vulnerable. In addition to the inherent weaknesses of passwords, managing them is also time-consuming and sometimes a risky task. A password manager generates secure, random passwords for you and remembers them so you don't need to. Most password managers assist you in avoiding pinching. A virtual private network, or VPN, provides a secure tunnel through the internet for transmitting messages and data via a private network. It's often used so remote users have a secure connection to an organization's network. VPNs can also be used to provide security for extranets, which are networks set up between an organization and an external entity such as a supplier. Data is encrypted before it's sent through the tunnel with a protocol, such as a Layer 2 Tunneling Protocol, or L2TP, or Internet Protocol Security, IPSEC. The cost of setting up a VPN is usually low, but transmission speeds can be slow, and a lack of standardization can also be a problem. An organization leases the media used for a VPN as an unneeded basis, and network traffic can be sent over a combination of public and private networks. Data encryption transforms data, called plain text or clear text, into a scrambled form, called ciphered text, that cannot be read by others. The rules for encryption, known as encryption algorithm, determine how simple or complex the transformation process should be. The receiver then unscrambles the data by using the decryption key. 
One of the oldest encryption algorithms used by Julius Caesar is a simple substitution algorithm in which the letter in the original message is replaced by the letter three positions farther in the alphabet. A commonly used encryption protocol is Secure Sockets layer known as SSL, which manages transmission security on the internet. The next time you purchase an item online, notice that the HTTP in the browser address bar changes to HTTPS. You might also see a padlock icon in the status bar at the bottom to indicate that your information has been encrypted and hackers cannot intercept it. A more recent cryptographic protocol is Transparent Layer Security or TLS which ensures data security and integrity over public networks such as the internet. Similar to SSL, TLS encrypts the network segment used for performing transactions. In addition to being encryption protocols, SSL and TLS have authentication features. As mentioned, encryption algorithms use a key to encrypt and decrypt data. The key's size varies from 32 bits to 168 bits, the longer the key, the harder the encryption is to break. A PKI, a public key infrastructure, enables users of a public network, such as the internet, to securely and privately exchange data through the use of a pair of keys, a public one and a private one. Asymmetric encryption uses two keys, a public key known to everyone and a private or secret key known to only one recipient. Each company conducting transactions or sending messages gets a private key and a public key. A company keeps its private key and publishes its public key for others to use. The symmetric encryption, also called secret key encryption, is the same key used to encrypt and decrypt the message. The sender and receiver must agree on a key and keep it. Advanced encryption, standard or AES, a symmetric encryption algorithm with a 56-bit key is the one used by the U.S. government. The problem with the symmetric encryption is that sharing the key over the internet can be difficult. Encryption can also be used to create digital signatures that authenticate senders' identities and verify the message or data has not been altered. When you send the encrypted message and a digital signature, the recipient has your public key and uses it to decrypt the message, and then uses the same algorithm that you did to hash the message and create another version of the message digest. Next, the recipient uses your public key to decrypt your digital signature and get the message digest you sent. The recipient then compares the two message digests. If they match, the message was not tampered with, and this, it is the same one that you sent. Many organizations now follow the CERT model to form teams that can handle network intrusions and attacks quickly and effectively. CERT also conducts a public awareness campaign and researches internet security vulnerabilities and ways to improve security systems. Network administrators and e-commerce site managers should check with CERT coordination centers for updates for protecting network and information resources. In addition, the Office of Cybersecurity at the Department of Energy offers a security service, Cyber Incident Response Capability. Cyber Incident Response Capability's main function is to provide information on security incidences, including information system vulnerabilities, viruses, and malicious programs. Cyber Incident Response Capability also provides awareness training, analysis of threats and vulnerabilities and other services. Some organizations use a classroom setting for training and others conduct it over an organization's intranet. Tests and certificates should be given to participants at the end of these training sessions. Organizations should understand the principles of the Sarbanes-Oakley Act of 2002 and conduct a basic risk analysis before establishing a security program. The following steps should be considered when developing a comprehensive security plan. Set up a security committee with representatives from all departments as well as upper management. Post the security policy in visible places or post copies next to all workstations. Raise employees' awareness of security problems.
Use strong passwords that don't use the same passwords across systems or websites. Install software patches and updates on operating systems on a regular basis. Revoke terminated employees' passwords and ID badges immediately to prevent attempts at retaliation. Keep sensitive data, software, and printouts locked in secure locations. Exit programs and systems promptly and never leave logged on workstations unattended. Limit computer access to only authorized personnel. Compare communication logs with communication billing periodically. Install antivirus programs and make sure they're updated automatically. Install only licensed software purchases from reputable vendors. Make sure fire protection systems and alarms are up to date and test them regularly. Check environmental factors such as temperature and humidity levels. Use physical security measures such as corner bolts and workstations and ID badges and door locks. Install firewalls and intrusion detection systems. If necessary, consider biometric security measures. Every organization needs to follow every step. However, some might need to include even more to fit their needs.